chapter 9. We'll begin in verse 2 this morning. Uh, We come now to an absolutely epic event in the Gospel of Mark, uh, which is also recorded in Matthew and Luke. (coughs) Excuse me. Uh, This event is uh, called the Transfiguration. And we get the name from the very first verse in the passage. So let me just go ahead and read that first verse, verse 2. It says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. So that's where we get the word transfiguration. Um, the Greek word is metamorphothe, which what word, what word do you think we get from that? Metamorphosis, right? So when we think of metamorphosis, I don't know, maybe you think of like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly or something. I actually think of a, a book that, uh, that I read in my Western Civ class in college called The Metamorphosis. Anybody know that book? Um, actually, I don't even know if I read the book. I might have just read the cliff notes. Did you raise your hand back there? You, did, did you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was about to be impressed by you. <laughs> But like I said, I, you know, I, I might have just read the cliff notes for it. Uh, this is, but it, it's a bizarre book. It's, it's a ni- written in 1915. It's called The Metamorphosis. It's about a salesman who like, wakes up one morning and he had turned into an insect, <laughs> a large insect. So I don't know. I actually kind of want to go back and, and uh, read that again, or perhaps for the first time. Um, but, uh, but at least I remember that much of it, that he, uh, he was transformed into a large insect. Kind of strange, isn't it? Um, Well, the major difference here, besides the insect part, is that Mark is not saying that Jesus was transformed into something that he was not before. Of course, that's key as we consider this transfiguration, this metamorphosis. It's not to say that Jesus was transfigured or transformed into something that he was not before, but rather we see in this passage, in this event, we see a metamorphosis of his appearance to reveal externally the glory within. Right? There was a glory that already existed within him that is now revealed externally in uh, what is called the transfiguration. All right, so let's go ahead and read this together now. Um, before I have you stand, I'll, I'll give a little, little disclaimer here. Um, I was going to cover this whole passage this morning. Uh, verse 2 all the way through verse 13. And man, in my sermon prep, it just it was a doozy. I, I realized that I was biting off more than I could chew, mostly just that there's no way that I could fit it all into one sermon without having you here for like two hours. And so maybe you're bummed that I'm not going to keep you here for two hours. Um, but uh, basically late last night, <laughs> as I was still kind of struggling and, and compacting the sermon, I had to make a call that all right, I've, got, I've got to cut this sermon in half and I have to kind of restructure it so that it works. So long story short, um, we're, we're just covering these first uh, seven verses, verses two through eight this morning, Okay. So, um, if you would stand with me, uh, and we'll read this together. And these verses really do cover uh, the main event of the transfiguration, because the verses that follow are when they're coming down from the mountain and and have a discussion related to it. Beginning in verse 2, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. Let's pray. God, as we consider this spectacular event, I pray, Lord, that we will 
be in awe of the glory of Christ, that we will see the meaning behind this, and that we will see its application for us. We pray that you give us insight by your Holy Spirit. And through my preaching of the Word, God, I pray that you will guide me and that uh, you'll all give us, give us all ears to hear. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So two points, or rather pleas this morning, and hopefully uh, did, uh, did you guys get my altered points? Okay, good. Two points or two pleas this morning. The first is, may we treasure Jesus as the divine Son of God. And then number two, may we listen to him and trust in his word. So first, the plea is, this is a response to what we've read here uh, in this event of the transfiguration. May we treasure Jesus as the divine Son of God. So verses 2 through 3, let's just look at them again. Verses 2 through 3, it says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. That's quite the description, isn't it? Radiant, intensely white. I, I'm thinking of like maybe some kind of laundry detergent commercial uh, could, uh, could be fit in uh, to this scenario. As no one could bleach them. Or I think some translations actually say as no one could launder them. All right, so um, we see that Jesus becomes radiant on this mountain with Peter, James, and John. The English word and the Greek word behind it uh, literally means to shine, right? To be radiant, to shine. And so a rough translation could be that he became shining. He began to shine physically, literally, right? Can you imagine that? This, this really is like otherworldly stuff. This is a spectacular thing that they witnessed. Here we see Jesus in all of his glory, which is not to say that he was any less glorious before or after. Remember, that's key, right? This transfiguration is not that he's becoming something that he was not, but that what he is is being revealed in the transformation of his physical appearance. All right, so we see him in all of his glory, but it's not to say that he was any less glorious before or after this. It's just to say that his glory was veiled, which I think was probably a necessary thing right, throughout his life on earth. That his glory was veiled. But here for a moment we see the veil of his frail humanity is lifted and his glory shines forth. It's important for us to not lose sight of the glory of Christ. Because I think think it can be easy for us to maybe fall into a one-dimensional view of Jesus. Uh, Perhaps to see him only as the good shepherd that he is, and yet not as the king of glory. Or perhaps some people see it the other way around. To some, Jesus is this. To some, Jesus is that. Of course, we can apply this to God the Father. We can apply this to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all together. Right? There's this huge spectrum of attributes that we see in the divine nature. And sometimes we might tend to kind of focus on this or that. But we must acknowledge that it's all there, right? So even in the person of Jesus, well, like King David from whose line he came, Jesus is both shepherd and king, both meek and majestic, both humble and glorious. That whole spectrum is always there in the person of Jesus, and yet these attributes have manifested themselves in different ways at different times, haven't they? Right? We don't always see all of them so clearly. But we must not make the mistake to think that they're not always there. They are. And so, for example, here we see in the midst of his earthy, humble humanity, that his radiant glory suddenly shines through. And we will see the Reverse as well. For right now, Jesus is 
highly exalted, and he will come again in great power and glory, only to dress himself for service and service at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I get that from Luke 12, 37. And so we see Jesus always possesses these various attributes, but they come forth in different ways at different times. And so again, here we see you know, Jesus in his frail humanity, right, in the incarnation as he walks on this earth. He's probably quite sweaty and tired from climbing up that mountain. Most of us probably wouldn't have even made it up the mountain. I often think about how, uh, what, what great of shape Jesus and the disciples must have been in. But then in the midst of all that, we see this radiant glory shine through. As we consider the radiance of Jesus here in the transfiguration, we are given not only a glimpse of his glory, but indeed his divinity. I think that this is a testimony to Jesus' divinity, that he is, in fact, God. This is to say that the, the radiance that we see here It's not a mere reflection of God's glory, as was the case with Moses in the book of Exodus. Do you remember Moses, whenever he goes up on the mountain, and he says to the Lord, show me your glory, and and, and God passes before him, and basically he just gets to see the the glory of God's backside. And then we see that Moses' face becomes radiant, that Moses' face shines as a reflection of the glory of God. So there's a similarity here, but there's a key difference in that Jesus is not merely reflecting the glory of God, but it's coming from within. I'm reminded of Hebrews 1, 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Those are strong words, aren't they? This is what Peter, James, and John so vividly saw before them. And it must have been an an incredible sight. And then to top it off, Moses and Elijah show up. (laughs) Verses 4 through 6. Gets a little strange here, doesn't it? And there appeared to them Elijah with there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus, right? So, of course, Elijah and Moses have been dead for centuries. These key figures of the Old Testament, now they're here with Jesus. Verse 5, and Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. We we all know those people who can't just, they just can't stand a moment of silence. And we've got to say something, (laughs) right? You think of someone like that, maybe you're like that, I don't know. I know I can be like that sometimes. Um, Peter was certainly like that. He had to say something, right? And so uh, he says, ah, let, let's, let's make some tents for them. And then notice, notice what it says. It says, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Well, there's a lot that can be said of, of those verses. And I'm actually going to address them in uh, much greater detail next week because they relate well to verses 9 through 13, right? As they come down from the mountain, uh, they begin to talk about the significance of Elijah and and Jesus' fulfillment of uh, the law and the prophets. But for now, suffice it to say that here Moses, I think we can say that Moses represents the law, that Elijah represents the prophets, uh, which is kind of a shorthand way of, of speaking of the entirety of the scriptures, and the implicit, the implicit message here is that Jesus is the fulfillment of it all, and all of it points forward to Jesus. That's important for us to remember as we're reading through the law and the prophets, as we're reading through the Old Testament, that we remember and that, that, that we even seek to see how it all points to Jesus But again, we'll come to that again next week. Concerning this first plea, this first plea, again, is that we, well, let me remember it. Again, I I changed my points. 
that we treasure Jesus as the divine Son of God. Notice, it's not merely that we treasure Jesus as divine, right? So I think we do clearly see his divinity in the the radiance that we see here, especially as we consider other passages and the whole of New Testament teaching. But I'm, but I'm pleading that we not only treasure him as divine, but as a divine son of God. Because, well, that's what we see in verse 7, isn't it? Verse 7, it says, And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. It's kind of similar to Jesus' baptism, isn't it? Right? It's kind of a similar scene. You know, from the very first of the very first verse of his gospel, Mark presents Jesus to us as the Son of God. All right, you remember that, that opening to the gospel? It says at the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, some, uh, perhaps uh, if you have a good Trinitarian mindset, uh, this right off the bat is a witness to Jesus' divinity, right? That Jesus is God. But others might say, well, wait a second. If, if Jesus is the Son of God, how can we say that Jesus is God, right? He's either the Son of God or he is God. How, how can he be both? So kids, This is where it relates to the catechism questions this morning, right? About God is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's kind of what we're getting at here. We're getting at the Trinity. But specifically, we're speaking of these two persons of the Trinity, the Father and the Son. And that really is where the answer is. But it's not just in some kind of construct that we've made up. First of all, we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit throughout the New Testament many, many times together. But... I think we have a clear answer to our question in John 1.1. 1, 1. So again, the question is, if Jesus is the Son of God, how can we say that Jesus is God, right? He's either the Son of God or he's God. It can't be both. It doesn't make sense. All right, Silas is either my son or he's me. But he can't be both, All right? That's what some might say. And, and, and you'll see that there's a misunderstanding of the language here. Um, but let's just consider John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now I'll remind you that John was one of these witnesses on the mountain. Remember? Peter, James, and John. And you're probably familiar with verse 14 of John chapter 1. This actually clarifies who the Word is, right? So I just said in John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word. Well, who is the Word? Well, John 14, sorry, John 1.14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. All right, so this is speaking of Jesus. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And what are the next words? And we have seen his glory. Now, have you ever considered what John means by that? And we have seen his glory. I think he's speaking of the transfiguration. He was a witness to the transfiguration. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Son from the Father, uh, that is going to help us make sense of things. But but, but let's let's just go back to verse 1, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All right, so everybody, kids included, How can Jesus be with God and be God at the same time? He was with God and he was God. How can he be with God and be God at the same time? It's a very similar question to how can someone be the son of God and be God at the same time? What what was that? That is true. That is true. Yes. So you're getting at it. Very good. Um. When we consider the word with God, much like the phrase son of God, we must understand that God is being used as shorthand for God the Father. 
We see this throughout the New Testament. It's key that we understand this, right? When we see the word God, we need to put our thinking caps on and look at the context and see, okay, is this referring to God in his entirety, like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Or is perhaps this referring to God the Father? And I think it's clear, for example, when we see the phrase Son of God, well, it's saying Son of God the Father. Likewise, when it says that the word was with God, Specifically, what that means is that he was with God the Father, right? Which again, later in verse 14, it says, you know, uh, we've seen his glory, glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. So we have this relationship of the Father and the Son in mind, right? And so when we see that Jesus was, that the Word was with God, it means that he was with God the Father. And then when it says that he was God, well, we see that from the very beginning, Jesus has shared in the Father's divinity, and that of the Holy Spirit as well. So you see, Jesus is with God because he's with God the Father, and also he's with God the Holy Spirit. And he was God, he is God, because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit share in divinity. One God, three persons. So, We can therefore say that Jesus, as the Son of God, is indeed God the Son. It works both ways, right? Jesus, as the Son of God, is God the Son. And I can't help but think of, remember Thomas, whenever Jesus in his uh, resurrected, glorified body finally appears to Thomas, what does he say? He says, my Lord and my God. As we think about treasuring Jesus as the divine Son of God, of course it's important that we recognize Jesus' divinity. As we see testified to in this passage, but again, even more clearly taught throughout the New Testament, it's important that we recognize that, but not just recognize it, but that we're gripped by it, or that we treasure it, that we say with Thomas, my Lord and my God. And as we consider Jesus specifically as the Son of God, again, as the Son of God the Father, consider this word that we might so easily skim over. The pronouncement from the mountain is, this is my beloved Son. So easy for us just to skip over that Bible talk, right? But that's an important word. This is my beloved Son. I wonder how much have you pondered the Father's love for the Son. Actually, was, I was listening to something the other day on the Puritans. I can't remember what Puritan author it was, but um, the, uh, the lecturer was, was talking about how this author um, which, went to great lengths to talk about the Father's love for the Son and how that should impact us. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't think I've really thought a whole lot about that. I think maybe we, we tend to more think of The son's love for the father, maybe because we see it illustrated in so many ways in Jesus' life. But we see the father's love for the son, right? My beloved son. And that's a glorious thing to think of. And not only that, but it should should fuel our love for the son, our love for Jesus, right? That is to say, if you want to be like God then you need to love Jesus because God loves Jesus. That is, God the Father loves Jesus. And so, as we treasure Jesus as the divine Son of God, we recognize His divinity, we fall before Him, we say, my Lord and my God, and we see that as the Son of God, as the beloved Son of God the Father, that we are given this example, even this motivation to love him in the same way. The second plea, may we listen to him and trust in his word. Verse 7, again, this pronouncement. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Why Why does he say this? Why does... This voice, that is the voice of the Father. Why does he say, listen to him? 
Well, of course, we're to listen to him. But, but why does he say that? Like, there's got to be uh, maybe some particular reason why he's saying this. And so we consider the context and we think, okay, why, why is he saying listen to him? Well, I think it's because there was something the disciples just weren't getting. You'll remember this is right on the heels of Peter's great confession, perhaps just Six days after it, um, we, we don't know exactly for sure, but, but it looks like it, it was probably back-to-back with, with what we see uh, preceding this six days before. But we know it wasn't long ago that, that Peter had made his great confession, you are the Christ. And this is, this is the pinnacle of Mark's gospel, right? Or perhaps this is... Uh, a contender to that, but, but certainly Peter's confession, you are the Christ. It's a very, very high, high moment, isn't it? And then yet right after this, Jesus tells them how he is going to suffer and be rejected and killed and rise on the third day. Remember that? Peter says, you are the Christ. And then Jesus goes straight into saying that he's going to suffer, be rejected, killed, and then rise on the third day. And the text says this. It says, and he said these things plainly. Jesus said it plainly. But because of their preconceived notions about the Messiah, the disciples, they just could not accept it. In fact, Peter rebukes Jesus for it. We all know uh, how that went over. But we see that they would not listen to him, right? So perhaps this is why the voice from heaven is saying, listen to him. Because here now we find ourselves again at a high point, uh, both literally and figuratively, on this mount of transfiguration. And this time, in anticipation of what's to come, The voice from heaven, the voice of the Father says, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. For as they came down the mountain, we'll see next week, Jesus speaks again of his coming fate. That's what comes right after this call. Listen to him. It's quite the roller coaster, isn't it? One might wonder, why would Jesus take them from such highs to such lows, right? This recognition of Jesus as the Messiah, and then I'm going to suffer, be rejected and killed, and then raised from the dead. We see it play out again in our passage here. The high to the low. Again, we'll see next week what Jesus says of this coming fate. But one might wonder, why would Jesus take them from such highs to such lows? I think it was to show that he is both the messianic king of glory and the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 and many other passages that prophesy his suffering and death. But you see, it was hard. It was so hard for them to fit that together, for, us to, for them to accept both of these things. And what Jesus is wanting them to see is that the gospel is big enough to encompass both. Indeed, it must. It's essential that the gospel encompasses both of those things, the glory of Christ and who he is, as we've seen so clearly in the transfiguration. But then, again, this reminder of how he will suffer, how he will be treated with contempt, Uh, to use the language that we see later in this passage. The gospel must include those things if we were to understand it rightly. And so this is why the Lord says to them from the cloud, listen to him. But the disciples, they had a really hard time listening to Jesus when it came to this matter. Two more times in Mark, Jesus will foretell his fate just as plainly as the first time. And yet, we are told they did not understand the saying. I suppose they thought he was speaking in a riddle or something. Um, For surely he could not really mean what he was saying. It can't mean this, they thought. And so even though it was spoken plainly to them, they still would not receive it. 
We can be guilty of the same in our own context. Of course, we don't uh, have the privilege of walking with Jesus down the mountain, but we have his word here before us, don't we? And oftentimes, we may find ourselves simply dismissing or explaining away scriptures that don't fit our expectations or intuitions. Right? Just like Jesus' is coming suffering, rejection, and death did not fit with what the disciples expected. It didn't fit their preconceived notions. So they didn't listen to it. Sometimes we can be guilty of that as well, right? We can be so culturally conditioned by our 21st century American ideals or even just by our sinful flesh that we, that we won't listen to God's word. But if, but if we... If we are to dismiss what doesn't fit our expectations or intuitions, how will we ever be challenged, much less changed, by Scripture? The only way Scripture will ever challenge us or change us is if we let it challenge our thinking, let us challenge, again, our, maybe our expectations or intuitions or fill in the blank. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Actually, the word transformed here is the same word for transfiguration, this metamorphosis, they, or however, something like that, right? <laughs> but the difference here. And there is a key difference, right? Is that the transfiguration that we need is not just one of appearance, right? Because, of course, we've made clear that Jesus was transformed. He was transfigured in such a way, not that he became something he was not, but that his external appearance showed who he really was, right? But the transformation that we need is not merely that, but rather we need a transformation of another kind. We need the renewal of our minds. And that requires truly listening to God's word so that it changes the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act. Right? It affects our head, our heart, our hands. This is what it means to listen, right? Jesus wanted his disciples to listen so that they would be formed by what he was saying rather than them them saying, no, it can't mean what you're saying. It's got to mean this, right? You, You see, listening to God's word our, 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 our minds being renewed means that we must let God's word change the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we act. Let me close with this. In his second epistle, Peter writes uh, uh, with his own pen of this experience uh, on the mountain with Jesus. And so remember, we've talked about how um, the early church understood Peter to be the eyewitness source behind Mark's gospel. He's the apostolic authority behind Mark's gospel, right? And so we see in Mark's writing, uh, I'm sure, an accounting from Peter and his eyewitness experience. But again, in, in 2 Peter, he writes it with his own pen. And do you know what he immediately goes on to discuss after writing of this experience? After, 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 um, after writing of being on this mountain with Jesus and seeing his glory he speaks of the certainty of the prophetic word to which we do well to pay attention right we may not be able to see Jesus transfigured on the mountain and 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 walk down with him and, and 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 speak with him but we have his word right here and that's what Peter's getting at right he says we have the prophetic word to which we do well to pay attention. He says of the prophetic word, this, he says, that no prophecy of Scripture comes by someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
All right, so as I've said before, as, as, as we consider these incredible things that we see in Scripture, particularly in the Gospel of Mark, we might say, oh, how I, I wish that I was there to see it. But we eat of its fruit. Of course, uh, we, uh, we now um, have the benefits of, uh, of Jesus's, not only his life, but his death and his resurrection and the advancing kingdom on this earth. But we also have, we have the word of God, the very word of God, to which we do well to pay attention. Let me close with this, just to say that, that this is an incredible book. And I think that this is how um, the, the second part of, of this sermon, right, this call for us to listen to him, this is how it applies to us, it means that we read his word and that we listen. In this word, well, again, we've, we've discussed already how all of this, it testifies to Jesus. And so, in a way, we are able to behold his glory as we read his word, as we reflect upon it. And as we do so, may we, therefore, be transformed by it. Not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewal of our minds. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful for Scripture's testimony to this incredible event of the transfiguration, what it tells us about Jesus. God, we're, just, we're thankful for the fact that we have the scriptures that tell us not only of this, but of so many other things, all of which testifies to Jesus. And so as we read it, as we behold Christ, may we treasure him as the divine son of God, and may we listen to him and trust in his word and your word, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.